chat here. So if you're curious, please read my uh, new articles. They're kind of cool. Um, second thing, tonight's presentation, you can get it from my GitHub. I'll throw that in here. So John Minor 3, I got a bunch of presentations. I've been doing this over about 10 years now. And so there, uh, let me go quickly over what's in here. So the code, what is a DBC? A DBC is just a compressed file download of the, you know, the code. So there's the code. Also, data. We're going to be talking about the AdventureWorks, okay? CSV files. So there's some CSV files there, okay? Jobs. Well, guess what? Jobs can be defined as JSON, right? We can take a look at this job and see it's a JSON job. We'll talk about workflows and jobs when we get into the presentation. And last but not least, um, here's a presentation deck that I'm going to see tonight. So let me see if I pop that in there. I already did. Awesome, awesome. Okay. I am proud. If you voted for me, thank you. If you didn't vote for me, vote for me next year. I've been writing for 10 years at MS SQL Tips, and I got Cloud Pro of the year, second year in a row. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm writing there. I'm passionate about a lot of things, everything mostly in Azure. That's where I get the work. Once in a while, my manager throws me in the deep end, says, oh, go do Google for six months. Hey, that's what happens when you're a consultant. I just recently wrote some articles on Postgres. There's going to be three of them coming out. So if you haven't done any Postgres, take a look. But I'm a avid writer. So with that said, enough about me. I hope I just didn't close my window, and it looks like I did. So we'll just log back in. It's not a big deal. So portal, if you haven't used Azure portal, it's going to ask you hopefully for a login. And if it's really a PETA, you get two factor authentication. OK, this is the Databricks class. What do we have here? We have a key vault because we need to have some type of credentials to talk to the storage and I'm going to mount it. That's one way to do it. You can also do uh, a full URL and this is the workspace. OK, and this is the storage. OK, with that said, that's enough intro. Let's uh, get into the slide deck and then we'll get into uh, some presentation examples. And that's the fun part, right? You know, learning uh, about what the product can do. Okay, so I'm going to hide the presenter view. I hope. Okay, cool. So again, my name's John Miner. I'm pretty receptive to questions, and you can reach me at john.miner at insight.com. Uh, usually, the only time on Twitter is when I am saying, hey, I just wrote an article. That's it. Go read it. So I don't really keep any of my opinions personal, whatever. That's my own. I don't put them out there for anyone to know. Uh, I've been an MVP. This is hopefully year number nine. So I'm looking forward to that. I am really proud of that. And I also love learning technology. That's why I do. I, um, you know, basically I was bred to do this, right? I basically, you know, got an undergraduate and graduate degree in uh, computer science, and I've been doing this for 35 years. And if I didn't still love it, I wouldn't be doing it still. So again, we're going to talk about, and I'm going to go back one side to say, hey, what's new in Azure Databricks? Okay. Product's been out there for, I don't know, we're in 2014, right? So four. And it started in 15, so it's about nine, 10 years. Okay, so a lot of things have changed. Okay, so let's look as a data engineer, it's definitely hard to keep up, and that's why I keep on writing. Right, and these top tier companies look at Microsoft first, it was Azure Data Factory, then it was Synapse, but still Azure Data Factory. Now it's Fabric, but still Azure Data Factory if you're using pipelines. You have to know what they're changing. Like I was showing, uh, you know, my colleague here that. MVP colleague that, you know, they got this new thing which you can suddenly enable and disable a activity. That's awesome. It's something that was in SSIS. Now they finally put it in product. I'm so happy they did. It's awesome. Uh, but you have to keep on learning, right? So Databricks, when was it first released? They came out on AWS. They weren't in bed with Microsoft initially. They came out on AWS. That's where they started. Um, it's the founders from the UCLA lab that actually made Databricks, uh, Spark. And so they got together and they said, hey, you know, we did a good job with Spark, but let's make it better and make it, you know, productionalized and let's make some money off it. And so that's what they came out in 2015. When I was working at Microsoft between 2016 and 18, it came on to Azure 2017. And the late comer was uh, GCP, right? In 2021, Google took them on, okay? What was the game changer, right? Well, before when you wrote something, right? You had to read it up, right? Make a change and write it back out, right? And the problem is you'd lock a file, right? It's all file-based. That's what a data lake is. And the problem is it didn't have any acid properties, right? 
Delta file format, if you haven't heard of it, and it went also open source, okay, was released in 2019. So basically you have that asset properties, and it's just basically parquet with a bunch of logging, okay? And today we're going to talk about what is relatively new in Databricks. So I'm going to start off how we used to do stuff a long time ago and how you can do it better nowadays. Topics. We're going to talk about core engineering. What is core engineering? Jobs have been in the product for a while, but they're called workflows now. And what could we do before and what can we do now? Why are they so much better? Okay. Before we used to do spark.read, that reads us up data into a data frame, and I'm still doing that in Fabric. So if you read my articles, you're gonna say, hey, John reads everything up, spark.read. It's probably not the most efficient. There's something called auto, auto loader. It detects when new files are there and just loads the differences, right? It's really cool. Talk about that. Built on top of auto loader is the next one, which is Delta Live Tables, okay? Delta Live Tables is really cool. You don't have to now worry about pretty much the underlying things going on, you define it, you can define it like a Spock layer. There's also a declarator, okay, for Python. I'm not a big declarator because I got enough stuff to learn. So if I can keep everything in Spark SQL, I'm really happy. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about cloning, okay? And uh, if you're a Star Wars fan out there, I'm not talking about the tack of the clones. <laughs> I'm talking about Delta cloning, which means how do we get data from one place to another? We'll do a little example on that. Okay, so what is Spark? Spark is a unified processing engine that can analyze data, and it has four main components. And again, this is all review of the data uh, engineering concepts until we get to the point where I can start doing some demos, okay? Um, what do you have? This is the main place that I work in. I work in nine out of 10 times in SQL and data frames, okay? However, guess what? You're going to be doing streaming with autoloader, so you need to know a little about it. Left-hand corner, if you have a graph problem like, hey, I wanted to go to Toronto, what's the best way to do it? I have a friend in Albany, uh, you know, and I have a friend in Pittsburgh, and I want to see both of them. Okay, what's the quickest way to get to Toronto? That'd be one graph problem, right? What's the... Uh, I always want to go to Philly first before I go to Toronto. What's a better way to do it, right? So those might be two different problems. Machine learning excuse me, is um, kind of like many different things you can do, but let's say stock, I can predict a stock, right? You know, I know Microsoft stock's gonna go up, how much is it gonna go up so I can sell, right? So database cluster, this is a good stop point and I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna go into the workspace, okay? So everyone has a workspace here. There's two ways to get in. You have to have access control, okay? Usually you want contributor here, so I clicked view my access and see I'm an owner, so I'm better than contributor. Uh, but you definitely need at least contributor, otherwise you get in, you really can't do much, okay? So once you go to Oda view, you click launch workspace, that's gonna pop you into the workspace, okay? It's gonna make me log in again. Hopefully not two-factor authentication. Why did I wanna show you this? Well, the problem is it, there's a cluster. And guess what? It takes some time for the cluster to start up. So I'm going to say, let's stop this cluster up. Okay. Awesome. So while that's going in the background, we'll go back to here. Pop this open. We're going to hide it and we're going to talk about what a cluster is. Okay. So there's many different types of cluster. You might hear the word high concurrency. You might hear the word uh table access okay you might hear the word uh user okay a user one is basically a one node cluster it has both the driver and executor on okay so the logical i want you to note this jvm here because this is going to be important when we get to the next slide okay so what we do is we create a notebook okay it can be any language uh fabric supports r spark and scholar um, the similar languages are supported in Databricks. Most people are writing nowadays Python. It's the most popular language out there. You can not only do data science, you can do engineering, you can do, you know, uh, web programs. So that's where I go. I go with Python because it's not a strongly typed language, but at the same time, it just allows you to get your work done quickly, okay? So we can see that when we do a task, let's say we're gonna read up an HR salaries file, 
And then we're going to do something to salary. We're going to give everyone a 5% raise because our company's doing good and write it back out. How does that work? Okay. Well, it has to use these nodes. And what these nodes are, the drivers, they're actually com uh, compute. There's virtual machines being spun up in the background. Okay. The driver is where the program gets launched from. And what it does is it compiles it into Java bytecode. And what it does is it puts it on the executor. So depending on how many executors, what is a slot? A slot is just basically your vCPU. So if you have a two slots, guess what? You have two vCPUs and this one shows eight. So if I had a file that was petition 10, I'd have to do two tasks. The first task would run eight of the file parts through, second one to run two. So again, partitioning is really important with really big data. Um, again, big data, terabytes of data, right? Spark is really good with anything under a terabyte. Psh, some of these concepts, you can play with them, but uh, it might not do too much. Um, you know, you could spend a lot of time trying to optimize it and you won't, might not get there, okay? Uh, there's a lot of other things you might hear Z order, V order, which Microsoft decided to call, which is an optimi uh, optimization technique in which you change partitions on how you're going to query the data. But again, that's a little out of scope here, and I'm just telling you that so you can read about it. Okay, so what is this picture? This is an old picture from Databricks. I learned this about five years ago. And it's about the Lambda uh, architecture. You might hear Lambda, okay, and you might also hear Medallion architecture okay and they're just coining something that's five years old over again medallion what does it mean well you have different zones a bronze zone okay is probably a copy of the raw data in a delta format so you can query it well where's the is there a raw zone well yeah there is most people sometimes have two zones inside bronze i usually when i create a um data lake i have a raw zone that's where the raw files it might be a json file i'm reading from an api it may be a csv file the only way i can get it from like a web page right that's the raw zone once we read it up we put it in the bronze say if it's a full load and we want to compare yesterday's recipe say i'm a chocolate maker and i have a recipe to make chocolate and someone changed the almond clusters how do i know what it was if i get rid of the full load file and just overwrite it i have no idea but if i keep multiple versions for auditing in bronze guess what now i can see those files in here right so that's bronze basically any data in its raw format other than maybe making it delta okay silver what is silver this is where you start to refine the data okay maybe you get dedupe it maybe you add more stuff there like for instance we have address we see John's address and it says street, STR, but guess what? We look it up in Google and it says drive. Maybe you wanna change it, right? That's your silver zone. And then gold is kind of like we prepare it for either, and again, I'm gonna move this over, AI or reporting. So if say it was reporting and we're using, um, again, we're gonna use AdventureWorks, maybe I want a sales report, right? If so, maybe we have to do customers against products and, uh categories right of products so that would be a join we'd maybe join that into a table and that would be a gold zone again the lambda architecture is two ways to do it streaming means real time things are coming into like a vent hub and in the vent hub basically it's real time it gets there we can read it real time and we can put it into the bronze and start processing it. batch you might hear semi real time or batch semi real time is just batch but it's on a faster time right instead of running once a day maybe semi real time we run it 15 minutes every 15 minutes the data is up to date okay so various file types there's it's just this is kind of like you know uh you got superman down here and you got the underdog up here right and guess what don't do weak file formats. I, I have a client right now and they're like, oh yeah, we're gonna give you a CSV file. I'm like, no, please don't do it. And that's the end of voice because I don't tell them, I say, well, can we have something better? And it's like, no, nope, you can have an Excel file. I'm like, okay, I'll take a CSV. Uh, but why are CSV files bad? They can be easily broken, right? And not two ways, right? Security, I wanna see it. Guess what? I take the text editor, I'm open. Guess what? If I remove the first line, save it, and then try to load it. I don't know what the file header is. I have to start guessing. I have to go research, right? Is the first field uh, numeric? Is it a string? It says SSN. I don't know which one. I have to read up the whole file to figure it out, right? Maybe in Canada, a, a personal identification number is totally different than the United States. In the United States, it's all integers. So again, these are the reason why 
weak foul types, you want to stay away from them, okay? Strong foul types. Uh, Apache came out with three of them. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, there's Arc, Avro, Orc, Avro, and Parquet. Okay, sorry about that. I was thinking Arc for some reason, but Orc, you can look them up. They're different types. One is like a column store. Another one is like a, uh, a row store, but they all use compression. Uh, the one that I'm going to talk about tonight is basically a Delta file, and that's Apache Parquet file. Okay, it is a column store, so if you have like male, female, it puts them in dictionary and replaces them with bits, so it does really great compression. It's also binary, so you can't edit it with a text file. Yes, you can break into it. If you download like uh, a plugin for VS Code and open it up, you can see it. Yeah, it's. But, you know, again, most normal people don't know those techniques, right? Uh, cool thing has column type names. It has column type values. Hey, it's an integer. It's a string. It also allows for compression, right? There's a compression called snappy you'll hear. Load patterns. And this is what I was just writing about on uh, Article 3 on my own web blog. But I was going over how to do it in Fabric versus doing it in Databricks, okay? What is a full load pattern? Full load of patterns are really good for small to medium data, site, uh, data sets, okay? And what do I mean that? I got a recipe for making chocolate at Hersey. It's not that big, right? It has to be not infinite, it's finite, right? Guess what, if I bring that pat data down over and over into the Delta Lake, it's not a big deal. Same thing with states, right? Incremental, okay? I am working at Amazon, I'm making a data lake, and guess what, I'm keeping track of all the orders day. That's probably a lot of orders, thousands, if not millions of orders, right, a day. Guess what, do we want to copy all the orders from, say, SAP into our data lake? No, right? So in that pattern, okay, an incremental pattern, okay, it always starts with a full load, and you have to determine how much data you want in your lake, right? So say the business comes to you and says, hey, I want two years worth of data. Well, you need to start with a load that loads two years. How do you might do it? Maybe you would do a daily load, but you set your pool duration to a month at a time. So we go back two years, it gets 2024. So we go back to 2022 January and we say, get me January's data from uh, January 1st to less than equal February 1st. And repeat that process, what, 24 times? We get 24 files and suddenly we got 24 months. Going forward on incremental load, we now don't have to get a month out of time. We can get a daily load, right? And that's cool. Um, incremental loads work really well. Problem is, guess what? Even with them, they can get cumbersome when you get a lot of data, okay? And that's where you want to start looking at partitioning and Z order. Partitioning allows you to divide up and say, hey, guess what? Most of the time when we look at patterns, and you know, I don't know, who's bought something from Amazon recently? Anyone on the phone? Just raise your little uh, virtual hand, say, yeah, you bought something from Amazon. But uh, the biggest thing, and I'll even raise my hand to kind of make this a little interactive, right? Is that, guess what? You bought something from Amazon. Great. Guess what? That's cool, but how far are you going to go back and look in your history? Not that long, right? So your partitioning might be by week. And if so, two weeks worth of data, great. That's pretty good because now you know the two file folder directories you need to read in to satisfy a query. Okay, this is probably the hottest thing since sliced bread when it comes to data lakes. Okay, Microsoft will say they probably created it. <laughs> Don't let them uh, listen at Databricks did create it. Okay, uh, it's a Delta file format. Okay, it allows you to do assets, right? It's atomic, consistent, independent, durable. You can either say, hey, I want the schema always to be the same, or I can let it drift, okay? Be careful when you let schema drift, right? Now you have some null data, so when you do queries, you have to take care of that, okay? Time travel. Has anyone here, and again, I'm gonna ask a few questions to try to make it a little more interactive, because this is like, uh, you know, one of those things in which, if you just keep it yourself, you're like, oh, am I talking to myself or not? But how many people, has anyone done Snowflake here? Raise a hand if you did. Any Snowflakers out there? Okay. Snowflake and Delta have the same architecture almost when it comes to hardware, Trace, You got basically a node and you're doing these little partitions, right? And guess what? Anytime you write a partition, you make a change, you have to write another partition. They call it micro partitioning in Snowflake. Same thing's happening with Delta. Okay, when you write a change out, guess what? 
it's creating a Delta file, POC file, with a log file. What is time travel? Because we're writing files each time, it's very easy for the system to say, hey, I want to see what yesterday looked at, version X. It's going to take the new Delta file that you might have loaded today and just ignore it. And it's going to show you a version of the data that looked at yesterday before you changed it. Okay, So it's kind of cool. It's supported, like I said, in Snowflake. Interesting thing. There's something called vacuuming, okay? And vacuuming is kind of like cleaning your house. Well, you vacuum, you have to tell it how many days you want to keep. And guess what? That affects time travel, okay? We talked about open uh, snapshot isolation. Yes, go to delta.io, I think is .org out there. It's open source. What is data engineering? So we're finally about to do our first demo. I'm going to check my Spark cluster to make sure it has not... Going to sleep, it's still open. Great. I'll go to workspace. Okay, so in Databricks, if you haven't used it, guess what? There's something called repos and workspaces. Workspace is where you do work now, repos is where you can check it in, okay, into your actual GitHub, okay? And tonight it's in a shared folder, and we're talking about what's new talk, right? Okay? And our first one's a workflow example, okay? And we're going to talk about uh, a full load and an ETL process. So we're going to click open the full load. Okay, and there we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run something once, just run one cell, and then we'll go back to the demo. Running that one cell will keep the cluster thinking it's doing something, and it won't go to sleep. Cool thing about Databricks and what they used to not have in all these things, and Databricks came out first, is time to live on the service. And what that is awesome is these things are expensive, right? I have a, say I'm solving big problems at um, Livermore Labs. I'm coming up with something in um, Nevada, right? I work for the government, right? Got tons of clusters, right? 128 machines. It's going to cost you a lot of money to keep those up, right? So you know, what you want to do is you want to have them auto shut down. And there's a place on the cluster you can set that, okay? So let's pick a quote from Wikipedia. What is this Wikipedia, right? It's a place where you can look up things, right? Data engineering, what does it mean? It refers to the building of systems to enable the collection and usage of data. So that's what we're doing. And there's really three things you need to really know. Spark.read, what does it do? It reads data into a data frame. What is a data frame? It came out of the idea of pandas a long time back in the 90s, okay? Uh, someone was working, doing data science with uh, financials and came up pandas. And what is pandas? It's an in-memory object, right, that has rows, tuples, and it has columns, and that's it, okay? Spark library. Spark library gives you a bunch of utilities to do things with the pandas. Like, for instance, I can do a substring. I can find a max of a column. I can aggregate, right? So those are the things you want to do. I like, now there's a thing in here which I didn't show, but I like create or replace temporary view. That's probably my most favorite function. Now why I do Spark.read, and then I say, take this data frame and expose it as a table. And the next thing I can do is I can do percents against it, and I can start running queries and looking at the data. Okay, It's my favorite, favorite method. Okay, Last but not least, having the data, we are data engineers, right? You have to write it back, right? So Spark.write. Okay. So we did that before workflow. So we're getting into our first demo, and I thank you for your patience. A lot of background information I have to get to. What was our first design pattern five years ago? We created a parent notebook, and a parent notebook was for scheduling. We created a child notebook that was basically the workhorse. So we got you know someone that's sitting on top. Let's think of it a bugging a buggy and a carriage, right? I'm the you know the person who's carrying someone in a carriage. Put a horse in front of me, which is the child, and I psh, psh, right. I'm making the horse do something, right? How do you make the horse do something? You have to give it parameters. You have to feed it, just like the child, right? And how do you make this whole thing work? You schedule it, okay? So it's a very simple design pattern, okay? Okay, what's wrong with it? It's very hard to enforce constraints between not notebook calls. So if I have, uh, I have to go ahead and run a process to a maybe create apple juice before. I ferment, right? There's no way if the apple juice doesn't happen, I can't ferment. How do we actually enforce that? Well, you have to hard code it, and it's really hard to do. We're going to talk about why workflows, a new version, makes it real easy, okay? So basically, we're going to talk about embedded calls in the parent notebook that call the child notebook. 
Okay. So let's take a look. So this is a cell. What is this up top? And again, if you've seen this, I apologize. I'm trying to, you know, give everyone a basis. If you haven't seen this, it's brand new. You're like, oh, cool. You, you gave me a total background, okay? So we have a data lake. What is a data lake? Well, data lake is just storage, right? So if we go back to our dashboard, and if you hold the shift key down, it brings up an L window, and we can stop playing with multiple windows to make this a lot easier. I'm going to go to my data lake. This is storage. Inside, you have something called a storage account. Inside, you have a container. Inside that container, you have subdirectories, okay? So we're actually, if we look at this, we're looking at mounted data lake AdventureWorks, okay? So there's AdventureWorks, and which version of AdventureWorks? We're looking at the ones in V2, bronze, okay? And we're looking dim product and this date followed by a CSV file. And if we're curious, we could go bronze here, right? dim. We can do, say, the currency table. And we can actually take a look at it, right? And if we go ahead, it used to be an edit and view edit. Guess what? We can see the data. Okay. So it's a tabular delimited file. Okay. So let's see what this table is doing. Okay. So we got a path to the file. We got a data lake path. So we're going to call this over and over again. We have a debug flag. That means, hey, it's going to tell us whether or not, you know what, um, we want it to um, display you know, hey, something happened or not. Last but not least, what is a file schema? Remember we talked about reading up. If we don't know what the schema is, then we have to supply it. Now, there's two ways to do it. We can infer the schema. But the problem with this file, again, if we look at this, okay, does anyone see something wrong with this file? Comma separator. There's no header. Uh, nope. There's, There's no, no header. header. Exactly. No exactly. Header. Exactly. Good answer. So the reason why we have to give the file schema. So we could have inferred the file type, but there was no header there. Otherwise, if we inferred it, okay, we would have done a header. Um, so we can, for instance, if we're curious when we run something, I can get rid of this. These are called widgets and then just basically parameters. And so the way Databricks does it, Microsoft does it a little different. So I got rid of data lake path, but I don't want to do that because it's very important. So I'll put this back. If we run this the first time, basically it puts it there. The second time, it doesn't really do anything if you call it, okay? So if we're doing some interesting stuff. I'm just going to run through this and see if we can do it. Um, debug flag, we get this path, make path. Let me see if I da, 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 da. Read, read. This reads it up, right, right, right format. Let me see. Petition count, data like, right format, overwrite, save, destination path. Okay, where is this? I apologize, it's been a while since I've looked at this particular piece of code. Not that long, but long enough. Um, okay, so this is going to be data lake path debug, petition count. This is our schema, but we already have it there. This is it. We're going to get the full path. Okay, so we're just automatically guessing that the path is this is the source path, right? It's going to make the silver path. It's going to put on the silver. And we're actually doing in this one, it looks like the product. Okay, so I'm going to manually remove it. Uh, it may or may not cause issues, but I guess what? I'm going to get rid of it. We know it's not going to cause issues, right? So we're reloading product. And again, I do this a lot of times, you know, you, you interactively work with the data lake during testing and test or debug and development, and then you do it. Uh, some things to talk about. We talked about partitioning. So if you don't give it a partition value, you in this one, I only give it a count, it'll tell it how many files it can save, okay? Um, you can see it's just printing it out. At the very end, we want to create a Delta file so we can play with this. And then we drop the file that's not there. And then we recreate it, okay? So I'm just gonna run this whole thing, okay? Remember again, we always have to have some compute and why did it not like me? Let's run all. This index out of range, why is it not liking? This is what happens when you do live demos. I will debug it though. Okay, so this is dim, data lake bronze, dim, this is the path, right? This says list index. Why is it causing me an error? File parts equals seven. Hmm. 
Okay. So one, two, three, four, five. Let's index out of so file parts equals split. Okay, so what does full source path look like? Full source path is this guy, right? So we're doing a split on this guy and replace. So we're replacing, we're splitting on the hyphen, right? Which is this guy. Right, and it's saying split seven. So one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five. I don't know why that's not five. I don't know why that's seven. Maybe this is an old version. I apologize. Let's say run this index out of file parts. Okay, let's do this again. Usually these work pretty good. I must have did something to a demo. So this is our path part, right? Right here, which I split it. So for some reason, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five. It should be five, right? This says path prots replace the quality zone. Five is a silver, right? Okay, maybe six, seven, but it thinks it there. Is this because the path is not being called the right damn not oh, daylight bronze? Oh, see, this is not the data file path is here. Why did the data file path not get a dim product path? So this is the whole thing right here, source path, right? Then we're saying full source path equals path parts. Uh, let's do this. I apologize. Usually I don't have any problems during my demos, but can let's. I, yep. Can I do you see it? Here for a yeah, on sure. line six, you have splitting on on uh, on the forward slash, and then uh, yeah. and then that gets you the file name, doesn't it? And then there's... no, that actually gives you a array right here. That gives you a array. It's a split. Okay, and then once you get the array, see this oh, is trying to take you're, the fourth you're trying spot. To get under the so fourth zero, one, two, three, four. It's replacing it. Okay, then bronze. what I'm trying so to do is I'm bronze, yeah. remaking as a delta, right, and I'm joining it back. So there is one bug. This was a seven, though. I don't know why it didn't like seven for some reason. So what I'm going to do is this. Let's just do this really quickly because I know time's flying, it, and I apologize about the demo. Yeah. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this and run this and I'm going to look at print of uh, path parts. And again, this is this is what's going to happen to you. You know what I mean? You're going to be in the world and in this production and this is what's going to happen. You have to figure it out, right? So for some reason it thinks before the slash, right, is nothing, right? So it's the first one that's zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, see, the interesting thing, it thinks this is four. Mount Data Lake Bronze. But when we replace, see, that's wrong. So this whole, this whole numbering, I don't know how a wrong version got in here. So maybe it's the parameters we're passing. Let's go back to the parent before we make too many changes to this and see what the parent's passing. So the parent's doing this. Okay. There you go. It's different, see? So now let's go back to the regular workspace. Full load delta table. And let's see. Okay, actually the Z. This is here, right? So Mount Data Lake Bronze. This is Mount Data Lake AdventureWorks Bronze. There we go. So that's the big change. And this guy is here, so I save it so I don't have this next time in my thing. So now, let's try going back to run all and see what happens. Okay, so, uh, nope, so it doesn't say, it says, Mount Data Lake VentureWorks Bronze. Did I, by mistake, put a... You still Venturework. have your code, uh, you still have your code commented. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And also delete. 
delete, delete, delete. Let's run this one more time. I think it's going to not work because if I remember right, this was a seven. I don't know if it's going to work, but and then seven. It's been a while, and if anything ever breaks, it's usually because naming conventions here. I probably should rewrite this to be something better, but I didn't. So that creates it. Okay, now it's working. Okay, see it removed the destination, writes the destination, and create it. So let's take a look. Did it work? And the answer is I think so. So we got rid of product last time. Right? Look in product, guess what? It created a dim product delta table, and we told it to partition by two. Perfect. So now it created a table. What is a table? Right? Let's go do a quick test. We can go over here, and we can go back one, which is the workspace. Right? And I'm just going to say, hey, guess what? I want to add a quick notebook. Okay. Well, there's something called a mockup, okay? A magic language, right? And the magic means, hey, guess what? I don't know why. Okay, great. Stop. The joy of Copilot, which I did not tell it to do anything. See, it's doing it. Reject. Do percent SQL, and I want to do is, um, show databases. Okay, so this is going to show us what the databases are, right? And if we go back to the recent ones, right? So it was this guy. Go back to workspace. I got this guy here. This is the one I did. We can see that when it created the database, let's look. Okay. Move destination. Okay. Dim dot product. And was it? We can go to the catalog here and take a cheat. Okay, it's under dim. Okay. So if we go back to that recent, which is oops, the other one, recent. Yeah, I just want to show you how to do a little testing. So we showed the database that's under DIM, right? There's another thing called show tables, right? So we do show tables, and that's going to show a listing of tables. Okay, and then look at the data. Guess what? We just peek at it, right? So default is like when you don't pass anything, right? So we can also say show tables under DIM. And then what's going to do is show tables. What is the syntax? I always forget. Or dim or dim. Uh, how about we do this? I know this is going to work. Use dim, semicolon, show tables. And it's, again, semicolons are really important. Now we can see it, right? And now we can see that the product table we built is here. And guess what? We can sample it, okay? So how do I get the first 10 rows in here? Does anyone know? Anyone want to guess? Yes, like top top 10 star. No? Yeah, good guess. Limit. But guess what? It's limit. Limit, yeah. Good guess. It's a trick question. It's the limit command. So it's using MySQL syntax, okay? I just showed you how you did data engineering the old way, okay? How did you put this together to do a solution? Okay, let's take a look at that. Well, there's something called dbutils. Okay, and dbutils is a notebook and there's a run command. Okay, and that's how we used to do it in the past. So if we go back to uh, workspace, okay, and we were in shared what's new on the workflow, we can see this the full load. That's why I showed you. And again, I call it full load because there's no merging notes, not an incremental, right? And what we can do is in here, we say run in ETL process. And the interesting thing, this is mock-up. If you have, don't know about it, again, it just makes your thing pretty. I just put an avatar, which is my little crafty DBA, and it tells you, hey, these are all the things I'm going to load. And how did we do this? Well, we're going to pass it a dictionary. A dictionary is a key value paired, and we're going to put everything in. So data lake path, data lake file, tray path, debug flag, petition count, and our schema. Okay, and we're going to do dbutils notebook.run, so on. I'm not going to run it, but it will run a notebook per each one, and it will rebuild anything. So anyone have any questions? Okay, cool. <laughs> Just joking. So you can see, even me, when I use it, you just got to be careful with the parameters, right? Even if you code something and you change something, you know, it's like, oops, just have to look at it. And again, trying to debug it at 7 o'clock at night after working all day, you're like, ah, what happened? So is there a better way to do this, right? And there is. That's what Databricks came up with. It's workflows, right? How do we do a workflow? Well, we need a child notebook still. 
but now we pass it through the workflow. And workflows have a bunch of cool things. Like we can have constraints, we can have emails, we can say, hey, if it takes more than 10 minutes, fail it. We can tell it all types of things, okay? So let's look at workflows. And this again is the second slice bread, I would say that we've gotten from Databricks in a long time. So, you know, really good stuff. Okay, so to be for workflows, let's talk about how we would have scheduled it, right? You go into task, and before we had this parent notebook task, right? And we would just point it to run the ETL process, and that's it, and there's nothing else. And on success, I get an email. Nothing to write home about, right? Jobs after workflows, okay? Task. Well, this one is just a sample of it, okay? So this one now, and the hard part about this is we have to pass all those parameters in here by hand, okay? It's quite tedious, isn't it? Okay, but once we do that, we can do precedence constraints. So we pass this one. This one's calling, hey, guess what? Make the count, and it has to path to all the data lake path. Debug fly is true. Petition count, what's the schema? And then guess what? We same thing, okay, uh, for currency. And then when we do customer, there's a constraint, right? So if we go down here, there's a dependency. Where's the dependency library? Uh, right here. This says I have to have the VentureWorks currency done and the count done before it goes. So there's a bunch of things we can add to these. Like for instance, if we go here in task, we can um, add. And where did I do it? Did I add task? I add task. And now we they put a bunch of things. So we can do a notebook, which we're doing here. But we can do a jar, a wheel. Uh, we can do any of the SQL components like queries, dashboards. If you're doing DBT, you can. There's an if else then condition. So if you have something and you run it and it comes out with an output, you can test the output and run it. We can also run another job. So we can do this one flow, could talk to other flows. So again, this is really simplistic. How do we do something that's really complex like this one? Wow, that's pretty complex, right? Anyone has any ideas of how we're going to automate this? Any guesses? I wouldn't. No? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Okay, I'm going to show you. And there's a better way to do it, right? So we're going to go up to desktop, right? Where this is a community talk, current talks, right? We talk about what, right? I hope they got the right thing. Here's all my jobs, okay? Job number two. Uh, okay, guess what? This current talk must be something that looks like it's there, but it's not there. So I'm going to get rid of it and go to this one. This one exists on the jobs. Okay. Right here, we can see that this is all JSON. That's all it is. And so once you know the pattern, you can cut and paste. And this is how I did this one. Cut and paste all by hand. Boom. Okay. So let's try reloading one. I got job 99. It's the same one as the other one. Let's load that, okay? How do we automate that? That's what I want to teach you, okay? It's not that complex. It's a little hard, but, you know, it's a lot easier than trying to do a job this complex by hand, right? So you got to do a little JSON, and we're going to delete this one, right? So job 99 is there. We're going to delete the job, okay? How do we do this, okay? Well, the very first thing is we need something called the Databricks token. Has anyone ever created a Databricks token before? Yes, I did. Awesome. So Databricks token is the way to go. So you have to go into user and the developer, okay, and there's something called access tokens. It used to be called Databricks. We're going to generate new. We're just going to put down Toronto user group. Going to give it a one-day life cycle, generate, because we're never going to use it again. Keep track of this because this is very important, right? Notepad. Whoops. This is another thing I don't like. I do not like the new notepad. It automatically keeps history, and I'm like, dude, you should just go away. I, if I wanted history, I'd go to notepad++. <laughs> not you. So we're going to go here. This is where we're playing. And has anyone pushed this button before? Yep. It's a cloud shell. And this is where all the magic happens. So what you need to do is you need to download the DB utils, okay? 
And again, I do too many things. I can't remember everything. So I actually went ahead. There's a whole thing on DVD Live. If you're curious, I'll throw it in the thing. Um, very useful if you have to do watch it changes. Okay. And I wrote that whole tip on it. But no, what we need to do is we need to know the workspace. I'm hoping this is the workspace. We need a token. So the very first thing is to install Databricks. And what we need to do is we need to log in with the token, okay? So I'm going to do a LS, right? And if we do that, we see job 99 is there. So I'm not going to upload it. But if we need to upload it, there's two buttons here somewhere. This upload, download, see? So I could upload a file and get a new file there. So I don't need that. I need to do, oops, it's not doing this, CLS, and then paste, right click maybe? Come on, there we go. Okay, so this one, first thing it says, where's the Databricks? Your Databricks is all the way up to here, okay? So uh, 5616, I hope that hasn't changed, and it hasn't, awesome. Sauce, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna paste this in. Okay, boom. Second thing is the token, that is your key. So like I said, once you lose that, you don't get in again. So we're going to paste this in here, paste, and hit enter. Okay, so now if we do the next command, which is, for instance, uh, databrix jobs list. Oops, come on, paste, and then we'll do list. This is going to list all the jobs, cool. So we have our job there, but we don't have our job for 99, right? So we want to load that, right? So now what we're going to do is job 99. Now we're going to say, hey, create it, and it looks for a file local to create it. So boom. Guess what? 99's been created. Guess what? We go back to our workflows, and lo and behold, 99's created. Any questions? So that is my suggestion. If you do complex jobs, use JSON, upload, use tokens, okay? Okay. So let's talk about what can be done with a task. We kind of went over this, but I'll reinforce it again. A lot of cool things. You can do code. Most people, I do it like, I've done everything I do with just a notebook, so I don't need anything else. If you need something really fancy, you, you can do DBT. Uh, you can do a data um, delta table, live table pipeline. So that's something you might want to do here. You could even call another job, but with the complexity and the number of notebooks and tasks you can do in a single one, I've never had to do it, okay? It's really a nice feature that they've added. Auto loader. Okay, so we noticed that before we had to go ahead and do spark.read and then create them. What happens if we keep on getting incremental files? Well, we have to keep on reading everything in and then merging it into the Delta file, it gets a pain, right? Then there's something better to do, and there is. It's called autoload, okay? How does autoload work? First thing is it basically needs to figure out, hey, a new file came in. Okay, two ways to set it up. The one I use nine out of 10 times is something called FileList. It's a default. Basically, and what it does is it has something called the Rocks DB. It's a key value store. Where's the key value store? It's stored in the checkpoint directory. What is the checkpoint directory? Basically, it keeps track of the files that you read. So if there's a new file that comes in, we drop it, it picks it up, it uses streaming, and it's scalable and reliable, okay? Auto load of details, let's talk about it. So we have a pro external process. Before we used to have a external process drop stuff in the raw zone. And when we processed it, we would read it up, maybe do a merge into the Delta table, and then we'd move it into like an archive directory saying, hey, we already processed it, right? This one, you don't have to worry about moving files. It just keeps track of, hey, got a new file, do it. So we can have auto load append to the bronze table. Then we can do a full over it. I'm going to show you full, but if you wanted to do an incremental, you just do a merge into it, right? Um, easy to set up, okay? Must code for each quality zone, okay? So I have to write a one loader for, you know, bronze to silver, uh, but you can use parameterized notebooks. I'm going to show you JSON. I'm not going to go through creating files, but I'll show you the auto load, okay?
So we're going to go back. I'm going to delete this because we don't need this token. So I just revoked it so no one can break into my fun space over here. Okay, shared. What's new? Auto loader. Okay. So this one copies over the database, and then we have a manual run and auto load JSON. So let's take a look at what the auto load JSON does. Takes a path, a flag, delete target. So that means I'm going to delete it and redo it, partition it a schema name and account name. Okay. So this means that it's going to first say one equals zero, which means it never is, then we don't create the widgets, otherwise create it, right? And we could do a remove all. So let's run it by hand. Boom, no more widgets, right? Want to put those widgets back out there. Just put this and guess what? Now we suddenly have it. Cool things. A couple things I didn't show you in the past is widgets can have drop downs. Awesome, right? And give it a bunch of values. This one, what is this going to do? Let's run it, see what happens. Uh, come on. Uh, okay, so debug is set to false. So that's the reason why this is not working. So we're going to do that to true. I'm going to just put this to true. And now we're going to run this again. Okay, so the data lake path is data lake VentureWorks V3. I'm going to create a two partition uh, delta table. Okay, what is it going to be? The notebook name's dim, right? The schema, account. Okay, we're going to debug flag true, delete targets for us notebooks. We're going to turn that to, we're going to make that true. So that means I'm going to basically delete what's there and then reload it. Okay. Remember, I said there's going to be a checkpoint file? There's a checkpoint file. If we don't pass a schema, which we're not passing the schema here, but it's JSON now, remember, so it's going to pick up some stuff. We're going to infer the schema. It's going to put it into the schema directory. Then we need to tell it where the raw file is, where to monitor, and where to write to. Okay, so we're going to put those two in. Okay, clear directories. If we said, hey, remove it, then we're going to remove the schema location, the bronze, and the checkpoint location. So let's go take a look at the storage. Okay. So we said it was in V3 of the data lake we're playing with, right? So now we can go to raw, dim, right? Here's our dim directories. Let's go back to which one. So we're doing adventure work, right? And then end, and we're doing dim account, right? So we go back to here. We're going to go to bronze, dim, count, okay? So we can see in the count directory, it has this directory. We have a delta file, table slash file, right, which has two petitions. It also has a delta log with any checkpoints and JSON changes that might have happened during the creation. Okay, and this is our checkpoint data. This keeps track of what files were processed. Okay, and then we also have a schema. Right, if we go down, there's a temp prop directory here. Okay, so I'm going to go up one to dim, and what we're going to do is going to run back our job, and this says just basically remove everything. Right. So it said true, so it's done. Let's take a look. So hit refresh, counts there. But guess what? Refresh, the data's gone, try it. So we moved the checkpoint directory underneath and all, um, the data files, right? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, one good process when writing stuff like this, we wanna know the before and after end counts so we know that hey we're going to try to get some data from here if it fails then we set it to zero and print it okay so there's no records we're going to do it okay next thing we want to start a stream so this is streaming now remember we went back to one of the things we can do streaming that's how auto loader works and that's how delta live table works so we're going to stream in json we're going to infer the column types we're going to put the schema here we're going to allow rescue evolution and load the raw path okay so at this point it created a data frame and this is the data it done this is a rescue value okay there's some things we might want to do to this for instance we want to put on basically the source file where did it come from and what time did we process it and then we're going to repetition it okay so now we can see we have those last but not least guess what how do you want to do this, right? We want to write the stream back out, okay, delta, okay? And what we want to do is merge. We want to checkpoint it, okay? Append, available and now equals true, and then just start. So we're going to start it. 
Now, there's an important part right here. This is going to do streaming, and if we look at streaming, it usually puts a thing here. It's not running yet. The main thing to remember is, see right here, it's going to bring up a job. It's going to tell you if you had a lot of stuff, it's batching it in raw data. But the main thing right here is we always want to wait for the stream to finish, okay? So we're waiting. It's thinking. It's probably trying to review. These are the stages of the job if you haven't looked at it. And then if you look, it gets really into the, remember I told you behind the scenes, Scala is going on. So you can see, guess what? There's a delete and so on. And you can go down the rabbit hole and look at each of the nodes and all that fun stuff. Way better than I ever want to know about Spark. John, I got, I got a question. Sure. Um, so it's the stream you're doing, then how do you actually connect this stream data? Is it through the Azure Event Hub or? No, actually, it's a different type of streaming. There's streaming for uh, Event Hub, and there's also streaming for file systems, right? So it's looking at the file system and saying, hey, is there new data in the file system to pick up? I don't know why this has taken so long, though. This should have really been done by now. And every once in a while, things happen that they don't go the way expected. So come on. But yeah, it's looking for, if we go back, there's a checkpoint directory. See, I don't know, maybe it might not work because that checkpoint directory is there. It shouldn't have been there. I don't know why it didn't delete it. So let me, but it says it's still running, but it should have canceled this already. Run it all. So I'm going to rerun everything. I'm going to stop it and see. So got the rec account, got here. It's running this job. We're going to rerun it. It's done now this time. It completed, it updated. It's running this guy right now. So it's replacing this and get me a file count. We can see, guess what? We got 99 records at work this time. So again, the streaming is not so much the stream you're thinking of as it's actually looking in the raw directory on the dim, on the account, and saying, hey, is there any files there? Because I deleted the um, checkpoint, it's going to say, oh, I didn't see any files yet. And it sees the files, right? Now, if we take the same job, and again, if we have time to do this, or if I have to go faster, tell me. We do this false, and now we run the job again. And what's going to do, it's not going to do anything, because it's going to see, okay, that the data is ready there. Okay, and if we go down here, it's the same record count. See, 99 didn't do anything. What does this checkpoint does? Is that automatically created the checkpoint in database? Yes, it automatically it automatically creates the rocks database, which is this checkpoint file under where you're streaming to, which is the bronze directory, dim, account, and see right here. This is your schema. It inferred the schema somewhere in here. I can't see it. Maybe it's this file right here. I don't know. What size is that? That might be it, 877 bytes. That's the schema. I never tried to look in at this. We can. Let's do edit. Does it allow us to edit? There you go. There's your schema. See? It figured out the metadata. So it figured out that schema, and then it also created the checkpoint directory here, which I've never tried breaking into, but we can try. Uh, where's the edit? Here. And we can see here, yeah, this is a GUID. That's it. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's get back to the program. So we talked about them. What is Delta Live Tables? Well, Delta Live Tables is taking this and put it on steroids, <laughs> bringing it up a notch, making it a little easier, hopefully. Okay. So what does it support? Okay. It supports, okay, uh, files, event hubs, and databases. It has two syntaxes. We're going to do a Spark SQL. It's wicked simple. The declarator is a little more uh, harder to learn, so I stay away from it. You have to use a GUI. You're going to write some notebooks. Uh, can be run as batch or streaming, like we said. You know, when you do auto load, you can say run now, run once, or you can say just run continuous, right? It also supports materialized views, okay? Easy to set up, built in monitoring login, must get used to new syntax, all data resides in one database. So before we had two databases, Okay, um, now we only have one. So let's look at it. 
we can do things like, and again, I'm going to show you the syntax at this level, and then we'll go into the demo. Okay. So we can create a live table, raw as, and then we remember we had that cloud file syntax that tells its auto loader. This does the same thing cloud files, data. So that's my directory. I'm pulling in JSON. I want to create a raw live file. Then I want to create a materialized view, which is create live table, clean data as from and it knows that this is a live table so it's live table dot raw data and then last but not least we can also do a declarator so this declarator right here says guess what i want to find scored records and afterwards i want to return read to clean data and map it to a model okay so we're not going to talk about that uh you can also do change data capture type one type two uh i've done type two it gets quite messy unless you really really need to have the change data capture stay away from it um it adds a lot of overhead so if you get a lot of small changes yeah you're going to get every single change in the file okay uh we'll go ahead and talk about delta change feed later so let's minimize this and i'm going to show you the last major example for tonight and then just kind of wrap this up. So under workflows, okay, there's a tab called Delta Live Tables. And this pipeline, okay, we have to give it some code. You write the code not here, but you just put it in. And this one is bronze layer, silver layer, and two gold. Okay. So if we click on it, it's going to open up the notebook. Okay. Let's take a look. So the syntax. I'm going to, because again, remember. In the previous one, and again, I'm turning my camera on because this is really, really important. The whole thing about Delta Live Tables, most important thing, okay, is that you can only have one table. So how do you have three quality zones and medallion zones in Delta Live Tables? You use prefixes, okay, and that's what I'm going to show you. So if you look at it, I'm using a prefix of BZ for bronze, AG for silver, AU for gold. So I'm going to create that streaming live table, okay, the quality equals bronze. And it's going to be AdventureWorks 4. And I'm going to say, in, you know, uh, raw, dim, and I'm just going to pull it in, okay? And then I'm going to say the same thing. Now, what happens when we try to run it? Usually when we run something right in here, it just tries to interpret it. But guess what? It's smart. It says, guess what? Bin is defined as a delta set table with schema structs. To populate, you must run it existing as a Delta Live table menu. So it tells me I can't run this. It already exists, and I can't run this, okay? So what can we do? I mean, how do we clean this up? And again, I'm just going to guess. So let's see. I'm going a little off script because I don't do these too often, but I know they exist, okay? Okay. So this workspace, right, we're going into a catalog. So it's going to do this catalog, right? And what's the target of this? Let me look. Is it AdventureWorks 2? Nope, it's not AdventureWorks 2. Uh, it's AdventureWorks, maybe? Okay, it's AdventureWorks, okay? So we can see AdventureWorks is where everything is, okay? Let's get rid of AdventureWorks, okay? Why not, right? The data is there. We can rebuild it, right? It's kind of like the $6 million man. Has anyone seen the $6 million man? So basically, rebuild. So we're going to do percent SQL. How do you drop a database? Drop database. Is there a special syntax we want to use? It's a trick question. What do you think? We want to use the cascade, right? So we use the cascade. That's going to drop everything. So at this point, we go back here and we hit refresh, F5. This should get rid of it. Okay, so now we have no more AdventureWorks. Let's run it. I want to show you a couple more notebooks and then we'll go into the run phase and hopefully build it and then we'll finish up with some uh, commentary. So under workspace, I wanted to show you shared, right? And I'm going to go under what's new talk, right? Delta live tables, right? Um, we can get rid of this because this was something I was just doing, right? So we're going to move the trash, okay? Let's talk about some things. We bronze layer, we're just pulling from raw, nothing new. Silver layer, what are we doing in silver layer? Let's take a look. We're going to create a dim products. And what we're doing is, if you remember the 
actual data dictionary for AdventureWorks, it has product key, product category, and product subcategory. So what we want to do is we want to basically join all the three, and we want to put some constraints here. We're going to say, hey, there has to be a product key, has to be a product sub key, and so on. So we're not going to bring any data in which is, uh, you know, full join not capable. Okay. So that's the first one. Second one. Let's bring open up the next notebook. So if we go back to workspace. Why do we have two goal layers? Why don't we define one? Well, guess what? There's a limitation in Delta Live Tables. If I want to create a table called AU goal data by region and year and month, I can do that. But if I want to create also in the gold, okay, a reporting which has it all aggregated, I want to take that summarized data by year, month, day, and I want to aggregate it and give you for a given model for a region, month, year, and calendar year, how many I sold and how much, right? I can't do that in the same step because this is dependent upon the other one. So only way to get around that, okay, in Delta Live Tables is to make it as two work steps. So what we're going to do is we're going to go Delta Live Tables, go here, we're going to run it. So I'm going to show you what this is, right? There's two ones, development, production, right? Production is like, hey, it's quick, that. Okay, we have these. These are all things. We're going to start it. Okay. And let's keep my fingers crossed. So right now it's waiting for resources. So, so this might take a minute or two. So let's check back this. I know we're running out of time. Let's talk about the change feed, Delta clones, and then we can wrap up with the last example, close out. And I apologize for the one demo issue. I don't teach this all that often. I teach like once a month on this. So I, you know, it's tough to keep everything straight when you're trying to learn things new too. So what is a change feed? Change feed is, guess what? We've got the original table, A1, A2, A3. And guess what? A3 is equal to B3. And guess what? We want to delete it. And then A2 is B2. We want to make it Z2. What do we have? And what's going to do is it's actually in the change data feed. We can see that we mocked as deleted. We got the pre image and the post image. Okay. You can read about the disclaimer here. Just download it. Um, you know, as long as you're not doing massive changes, it's great. You're trying to, you know, maybe you have that recipe and you want to know who made a change. Change data feeds, great. If you are constantly turning over something, probably not a good idea. Okay. What's the difference between a shallow clone and a deep clone? Well, it's not like Star Wars in which the guy who's a stormtrooper, you know, doesn't talk to you. He's shallow, right? Shallow clone is just basically you're doing a pointer, right? So I got something in prod. I make a shallow clone. Guess what? Dev is pointing to the same data. So be careful because if you delete something here, you're actually working on deep clone. Deep clones are awesome, right? They allow you to do DR. So I'm going to make a copy of a point in time, right? If you want to sync them up, then you have a DR solution, okay? Um, cool. So let me minimize this. Let's go back to the last one. Let's see if this is working. Keep your fingers crossed because if it does, I'll do the Delta clone and wrap up. If it doesn't, we're just going to wrap up. So the problem with this is the amount of time it takes to spin up a cluster, right? It's waiting still. And that's always been the crux of Spark. Databricks has a really good engine. One of the things that I see that I like about Fabric is Microsoft came up with a new idea of something called starter clusters. And a starter cluster allows you to get one to 10 node resources. Pretty much, I call it instantaneous. It's not really instantaneous, about a minute and a half when it's cold. Once it's up, you can run a query in about 10 seconds. So it's really, really blinding when it comes to speed. The most of the time you sit here with Spark is you sit here and you wait. You're like, okay, I'm waiting. What's going on? At this point, it's a perfect time to ask any questions. So I will open it up if anyone has any questions. Hey, hey, John. 
Sure. Hi. Yeah. How are you yeah, doing? Yeah, it's Kelly here. Hey, it's a great presentation. Uh, I'm loving it. A uh, quick question with Microsoft Fabric, the yes. one lake you know underlying is Delta Lake uh, for for Microsoft Fabric, right? Yep. But is that a just the open source and then Databricks version of Delta Live tables is better or there's more feature functionality or are they on par? The problem right. is they're a little different. Okay, yeah. so here's the thing. Microsoft came up with this idea of, have you heard of a data mesh? Yeah. So a data, yeah. so a data mesh is like, Kelly, you, ha you run HR and you're using AWS and you happen to be using, um, they have something called Glue, which is kind of like Spark, and you have your own Delta file format, right? And then over there, you know, you have Mr. Paul over here, and guess what? He's running GCP and he's running Databricks. And you know what? You both have Delta files, and I want to put them in one place to get like a single glass, pane of glass, right? You can use Fabric to do that. Now, Fabric, and again, I don't want to go too far off because definitely, but really excited about Fabric is that um take a look at my blog and i'll show you this image in uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, what is it here we go this will kind of sum it up right here and this image is it right here so how do you get lake stuff into the lake house you can use pipelines which you used yeah. to data flows they only so they don't support mapping data flows anymore which was like kind of like you draw something there was a bunch of errors like ssis binary. It only supports the M query, which is Wrangler data flow. So that's a version two. But there's something called shortcuts, and this is really promising, and I haven't written about it. I'm keep reading my blog. Hopefully by next month or so, I'll go through all this. Shortcuts is awesome because you know, what I do is I have, say, a GCP bucket. I put a link in it. If it is a Delta file, it just pops up in the lake as a table. That's what we're kind of uh, doing for proof of concept is to decide yep. whether we do shortcuts to our, like, because, you know, Databricks is more mature than Fabric. And then, I don't know, is it performant, just as performant as if you were it's supposed directly? To be, yeah. It's supposed to be, I haven't had a chance. Read through my yeah. article, I found four different bugs already. I, I reported a couple of them. Um, okay. <laughs> but again, I do not want to go off topic because it is a Databricks. I want to give the Databricks sure. guys their thing. They've been around. Blinding fast is one thing. Read through it. One of the things I did is unmanaged tables are not supported by the SQL endpoint. So if you don't use a shortcut, it won't show up. Second thing is that uh, views are not supported. Two other things I found timing bugs is most people wouldn't do what I do because I try to break things. Uh, we try and break things too. Not purposefully, but we do. <laughs> exactly. And, and what I do is I go ahead and fail to resolve flow. Why does it not like this? Uh, development, let me hit OK. So let me try stop, confirm. Going to rerun this. OK, why did it not? I want to see if I can debug this really quick and then end it up. So exception, table of view not found, Adventureworks, not kidding, because I got rid of it. So the question is, why can't I just rebuild? Is there a rebuild here? Is there settings say rebuild? Settings advanced, right? These are them. So here, I've uh, VentureWorks zone storage location zone VentureWorks target storage zones. I'm wondering if the zones is the problem here, because we told it if we look at the notebook, right? We told it is the live notebook, the gold, but let's go back to the bronze. If we go back to the bronze layer, we're telling it venture works here, but it's storing in zones. Let's blow away zones and then rerun this. I think that will get us back where we want. Again, nice thing about these, it's just files. So worst comes to worst, something blows up, just delete it and rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is causing this issue here. So I'm going to get rid of this zone. It's like, hey, your table doesn't exist. I thought it was there. What happened to it? I'm like, yeah, just get rid of it. Because the only thing I have is the raw data is in here. Right? It's my JSONs, right? Rebuild the damn thing. So let's run this again. Uh, don't need this. Cancel. And then start. Let's try. Keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully it will work this time. Um, yep. Anyone have any more question? I know we are almost yeah, sure. on time. Um, three minutes left. Anyone would like to question, ask any question? 
you can you know answer yourself and ask Chris. Hello, um, I uh, I have one quick question for you. Yeah. Uh, the the tasks that you um, you demoed in Databricks, I think it was, yes. is that the one with the workflow with the with the um, sort of the graphic graphical workflow. Now I was, yes. I'm wondering in your experience in 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 in, in the world in, uh, out there in the in the, uh, in the real world, are you are you getting to use that more often, or are you still using, let's say, the ADF like as an or orchestrator to you know execute notebooks? So, you know what's interesting? That's a good question, and um, we've been doing this at my company for five years. So we have a code base, unfortunately, that still uses Azure Data Factory. So that's yeah. the scheduling component. If you're okay. going to go to Fabric, guess what? The scheduling component is Azure Data Factory. So um, hmm. if you're doing like Kelly, in which he likes doing all his data engineering in you know Databricks, but then you yeah. have Power BI users and you want to manage the Power BI users just in Fabric, which it has its own workspaces for Power BI guys, and then put a lake up for them, then yeah, you will have to use a job. So that's where you do your scheduling. I like it personally. If you have external processes, you say, hey, run the external processes, just drop them onto the lake and then you just pick it up and you worry it's a data mesh you worry about you know hey you got informatica writing or you got ssis writing again those are older tools but they still work then guess what you just pick it up from databricks then you can schedule in databricks so it depends on how you're designing your architecture i see okay i guess it depends on the how how old the project is because that's that's what i've that's what i've seen done before but i guess things will change I've seen many different ways. And the question is, you know, which horse do you bet on, right? Do you bet on Fabric? Yeah. Do you bet on Databricks? I like Databricks because guess what? You get one and it runs on all three platforms. If you pick Fabric, you're stuck on Microsoft and that's where you'll be. That That is that you're absolutely right. I have one uh, one quick other quick question. If doesn't, if no one else has any. It's a very, it's a, it's a very, uh, yep. it's something that it, that it bothers me a lot uh, working with ADF and Databricks at the same time. Now, yes. um, in ADF, you know how we have um, throw out a pipeline, you, you drop a Databricks notebook activity, and then you, you know, in the settings, you point it to one of your notebooks. Yes. And um, now, uh, now, now, if I go over to the Databricks side. Um, then uh, there's workspace, and then there's there's there are your repos, uh, or, yes. or there's my repo. Now, is there a way to <laughs> go from ADF into Databricks and ha have it have it think that you know that the the two Git repositories actually work in sync? As in, I want it, I want you to land in my repo, not in the workspace. Ah, uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You, you, it's I funny, you brought, you. Up, you brought up a problem that I found the other day. Something was breaking, I was wondering why, and a fellow coder uh, from the client I'm working with decided to make a change, he, broke, he made a breaking change, and he did it in the yeah. workspace. And I'm like, dude, why didn't you do in your repo? And make sure you test it. And so, again, if you read my article, one of the things I see a lot of days is that people are putting code out there, there's no comments, right? I've seen tons of code without a comment. So please put your header, your algorithm, maybe a short one, doesn't have to be a big one, comments when you did it. Especially when I work for these clients, I come back to them, I see some code six months later, I'm like, even while I'm showing you tonight, there's an there's example. It's like, it's not that complex, but seven o'clock at night, no comments. Well, guess what? You're going to stop futzing around trying to figure it out, right? Um, second thing is testing. A lot of people are just not doing testing. And third thing is code release uh, grooming, right? People are not doing code reviews and making sure the releases yeah. are good. I'm not going to do the last example. Uh, you can do it on your own. Um, you. Something's broken, but um, it's not that big a deal. Trust me, you can rebuild it. I'll probably rebuild it afterwards just because it's bugging me. But uh, <laughs> uh, awesome. other than that, you know, yeah, they work. Thank you for, for the presentation. You're welcome. I hope everyone learned something. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'm continuously learning. So it's exciting. If I wasn't excited about this, then I still wouldn't be doing it, you know? And I've been doing this for 35 years. So um, it's good stuff. 
Okay, before we, we'll, you know, let John go, any any last question from anyone? No. If you find anything about Synapse that's broken that I haven't found yet, please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell the product team it went GA in November. Um, you know, they are they do give us plenty of work. I do a lot of Microsoft work, so yeah, I definitely want them to have a decent product. Another company. Yeah, when it's come to Fabric, I think, you know, uh, it's gonna take more more time to be it's gonna uh, take about a year. They've been yeah. talking about Synapse for two years, it's gonna take another year to get it solid. Yeah. There's things like uh, you know, when you move a window around, it doesn't display the right way and uh, like certain buttons and the security, I don't even know where it is yet. I mean, yeah, it's, it's going to take a little while, but once they get there, it'll be a good product. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. I want to thank, thank everyone you. for attending. <laughs> Have a awesome night and thank you, Mr. Paul. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, John, for your time and, you know, always love to learn from you. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.